All right, good afternoon. It is currently, let me see, it is November the 2nd, so we are officially in November now, folks. Uh, this is going to be your lesson for your Monday class. Uh, this week you'll have on-campus classes for both uh, Monday and Wednesday for this class, so I will be doing my best to record both these. I'm recording today's lecture now. I'll record tomorrow's lecture tomorrow morning, so they will both be up, and then your first quiz will also be up for you as well. Your previous lesson started on the basics of physics. We're going to build on the basics of physics and start talking about Newton's laws now and how they come kind of come into play with physical therapy, right? So obviously, if we're going to start with Newton's laws, the easiest way to start is this first law. Then we'll move through a second, we'll move through a third, and then hopefully we'll find out why he got arrested in the first place for all these laws. I'm just joking. We're just going to talk about the laws. So today we're going to start with some things, talking about order thoughts on motion. Then we'll go into Newton's first law of motion, how it relates to mass and inertia. Also, how it relates to speed, velocity, and free fall. So we look at things. Like, let's look at a pool ball resting somewhere comfortably on a table, right? We learned in the last lesson, the net force acting upon it is, you know, zero. It's not moving anywhere if it's at rest, right? It is at static equilibrium at that given moment. The only thing that's really acting upon it is gravitational force pulling the mass of the cue ball downward. And then equal to that is that supportive force resting on the table, allowing it to not get pulled and sucked down through the table and travel all the way to the earth. If all of a sudden the pool ball started rolling on the table, we'd have to investigate what forces now don't balance out to zero, right? That or we'd have to call, you know, Zach Baggins to come investigate for ghosts, whichever you want to talk about. But what we're saying here is that we know that no matter what happens, even if it is a ghost, there had to be some sort of change of motion in that item. And it doesn't occur without a cause. Somehow or other, there's been a change in the net forces acting upon that actual pool cue. So we're gonna look back and take back to Aristotle, right? Or as um, I believe it was in Bill and Ted's Aristotle, right? the Greek scientist who started studying motion in the first place, right? He came up with two basic types. He talked about natural and violent motion, right? Natural motion was thought to be either up or down. That's it. You went up, you went down, those kind of natural motions. And then objects seek their natural resting places. Boulders stick on the ground, smoke rises in the air, heavy things fall, light things rise. There was this other term of natural motion called circular motion, but that was only for the heavens. Nothing else exhibited circular motion. There was no such thing as circular motion. It was just up-down motion that we didn't understand, right? These motions were considered natural or not caused by forces, meaning if you jumped up, it was a natural motion for you to jump up. I don't know how that works, but that was what they thought believed. And we can see how when we look back on these things back then, it kind of seems silly nowadays. Then we had violent motion. Violent motion was called imposed motion. It was a result of forces that pushed or pulled. So going forward and back were actually violent motions. Um, the important defining thing about this is it had an external cause. So we're starting to look into, well, you know, something has to cause things to, motion, to move, right? Um, objects in their natural resting places could not move by themselves. Meaning if that boulder was on the side of a mountain, it wouldn't have moved on its own unless something caused it like a lightning bolt. Right? Thunder and lightning, very, very frightening, right? So objects always had their natural place. And they always said, and he, he looked at this from a perspective that all things came to their natural resting place. Even when he talked about things like government and things like that, you were to come to your appropriate station in the world as well. That was also looking at that natural motion. You never moved higher than you were supposed to be. Um, again, outdated type thought process, right? And this was kind of, you know, up to his time period, it was kind of thought for about 2000 years that a force to, that was responsible for an object moving was against its nature. Meaning if that boulder got knocked down off the mountain, that wasn't the way it was supposed to be, right? The gods caused it to happen, right? And we know, we look back in time, a lot of our look back at religion is just trying to understand where the sun went at night. Um, state of objects would want at rest unless they're being pushed or pulled or moved towards natural resting place, right? We're going to talk about that with Newton, how his, how Aristotle's theory was there, but not quite there. You know, most thinkers before the 1500s considered it obvious that Earth was in its natural resting place. The Earth did not move, right? That a force large enough to move the Earth was absolutely unthinkable. 
Or we also go back to the time we can also look back to the fact that we thought the earth was flat. Um, in which, oh, can we not think that we now have people thinking again that the earth is flat? Like, I just can't even stress how much that hurts my brain to think that, you know, after a you know, millennia of time, we just, we've accepted scientific fact that the earth is not flat. But now we have people that think that the earth is flat. And for those of you that don't know, this is usually my, one of my best favorite like conversations. I wish we could have this in real life. Just because there are people that are going to look at me and think that I'm crazy thinking that there are people that the earth are flat, think that the earth is flat. I'm not crazy. There's a whole movement called the flat earth movement that is convinced that the earth is a flat disk moving upwards through space, even though the rest of the planets are all around. The rest of those planets are just projections that the uh, the secret societies project on our dome that covers our flat earth. And there are even some that think that the flat earth itself or that the ring that we sit on is on the back of a giant space turtle moving through space. And you see how we keep getting further and further along this. And then on the outsides of the earth, there are these giant ice walls. And that, you know, when um, George R.R. R. Martin wrote the Game of Thrones series, right? And it's on fire and ice and all that. He was actually trying to clue us in to this theory of the ice wall around the flat earth and that there is a group that guards it called the Night's Watch and they will turn you away if you ever come near them and a lot of reason no one has ever seen the people that guard the wall is because anyone that's gotten close has died. I, I, that sound that you just heard, that was a few brain cells in my brain literally exploding. And the funny part thing about this is there are famous people that believe this. Um, <laughs> you know, to use up to this point, Don Jr., the president's son has even said that, well, maybe the round earth theory isn't a set in stone scientific fact. There is a rapper, B.O.B., I've never actually listened to any of his music and I'm probably glad that I never have now. And then like NBA players like Kyrie Irving believe that the earth is flat. Uh, I think Kanye West has even hinted that he might believe that the earth is flat. If you ever want to fry free human brain cells, go to the earth, go, yeah, go to the earth. Go to YouTube and look up flat earth theory. There was just a convention here a few years ago and I went to it and it was amusing. Um, you know, I would like to joke when I went to the convention that there are flat earthers gathering from all around the globe. Uh, and they actually said, yeah. Anyway, we've moved past that. Right? Just like we look at what they thought about motion, we've moved past that as well. So, you know, moving on here, we look at this stuff. Along came Copernicus. Um, I forget what they called him in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. But anyway, that's besides the fact. Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure is excellent, by the way. Even the new one's not bad. Not great. Not bad. Came with a simple concept that the only way science made sense was that the Earth and the other celestial bodies move around the sun. The bells lit up, everything like that. And again, right now we are saying that the Earth doesn't revolve around the sun, that the sun is a fixed spot in our glowing dome that covers, oh my god, never mind. Just, again, this idea was extremely controversial at the time. People preferred to believe the Earth was the center of the universe. And to say that it wasn't, you know, that kind of destroyed our whole theory of the way we existed, right? I worked on these ideas in secret because to uh, promote this is against the church and everything else like that. And came up with this de-revolution bus. It reached, you know, finished it on the day of his death in 19 or 1543, which he actually had a stroke. Back then we didn't know what it was because they thought he was being struck down by God for doing this secret stuff. Interesting enough, Copernicus made a huge, some huge contribution to science, right? But he's buried in an unmarked grave because in his time, his ideas were considered heretical and he was nothing more than a common man. So think about that. Like we know Copernicus made some really great contributions to modern science. He's just buried in an unmarked grave. Yep, well, they think they uncovered his, um, his bones in the unmarked grave, but they're still not sure, All right? Uh, he announced the idea of a moving earth in the 16th century. It's one of his main arguments against, main, one of the main arguments against a moving earth was well, if you consider a bird sitting at rest on top of a tall tree, the bird sees a worm, drops down vertically, and catches it. 
if we were on a moving earth, then that bird would have missed that. Well, we didn't understand physics at that point, right? It was argued that this would not be possible if the earth was moving as Kronika suggested. Well, and it is true. Birds do catch worms from high tree branches, right? But it said that this is proof the earth is at rest. No, what it was proved is we didn't understand mass momentum and mass inertia. We'll talk about that, right? So along came Galileo, Galileo, Galileo. He was a foremost scientist of the late Renaissance, right? 1564 to 1642. And yes, just if you're questioning it for your quizzes, you do need to know the years they were all born and they all died. No, I'm joking. You don't have to know that. Uh, he was outspoken in his support of Copernicus. He argued that only when friction is present in most cases in real life, which is in most cases in real life, is a force needed to keep an object moving. So he was the first one to come up with this idea of friction, right? He talked about it being the resistance to motion. Galileo demolished Aristotle's assertions in the 1500s. He was one of Galileo's greatest contributions to physics was demolishing the notion that force is necessary to keep an object in motion, right? And eventually, you know, um, uh, Newton is going to build on Galileo's work here, right? He said that objects of different weight free fall to the ground at the same time in the absence of air resistance. We know that's now a true thing, right? And a moving object needs no force to keep moving unless in the absence of friction, right? So friction was the term that he gave for a force that acts between two materials that touch. So if I put my hands together and I'm moving them, that feeling that I get that's actually heating up my hand, right, is called friction. Now there are all kinds of things I could do to lower friction, right? I could put something in between my hands that's a little slicker right here. I have my Oakley bag. Now that will reduce friction and my hands are freer to move, but there's still heat being generated, right? Because I'm still getting some friction between my hand and this Oakley bag. So I could reduce that further, right? I could take and I could get some sort of uh, lubricant like oil, WD-40, right? And then I can reduce my friction, but there's still gonna be a minute amount of friction. If we are able to ever overcome friction fully, that really is going to be a huge thing because that leads us to perpetual motion machines. And if we can lead to perpetual motion machines, we may solve the world's energy crisis. Right? One of the reasons why your car is not so efficient is because of friction. And we'll talk a little bit more about the combustion engine later in physics. But inside your engine, you have pistons. Well, unless you have a specific type of engine, we're not going to talk about that right now. Um, but inside most of your engines, you have pistons, and these pistons drive up and down and create compression that causes an explosion. Well, as those pistons are moving in their sleeves, they're sliding along the walls of that sleeve where there's oil. The oil keeps everything nice and lubricated and keeps friction at minimum, but it doesn't eliminate friction. So we lose a little bit of that energy that's created because of friction. So if friction were absent, a moving object would need no force to remain in motion. So theoretically, if we could eliminate friction, those pistons going up and down in that engine could go on forever. And therefore, we'd be able to create energy out of nothing, right? Perpetual energy machines. Pretty cool if we can ever come up with it, right? And then we have a force. A force is a push or a pull. Talked about force a little bit in last lecture, right? And then we have inertia. It's the property of matter to resist its change in motion. And it is dependent upon the, mat, uh, the matter in the object, what it's made of or its mass. And we're going to talk about those properties as well. But inertia is an object's laziness, right? So when you're moving stuff, things that are have more mass, not necessarily are greater volume, but have more mass, have more molecules making it up, are harder to move than stuff that isn't, right? Because you can think about it. If I've got a, say I take a chunk of lead and I create it into a hockey puck. And then I take a hockey puck and I make it out of plastic. It's going to be a lot harder to move that lead hockey puck, even on a surface such as an ice rink where friction is minimized, than it will be to move that basically empty plastic hockey puck. Well, and that's because of its inertia, right? We all have a different inertia because we all have different masses. So Galileo's rolling balls is an example of this theory of motion, right? He described two inclined planes facing each other. Balls roll down one side, picking up speed, go across a flat plane, and then they go back up the other side, lose speed, and then come right back down, right? If that ball just rolled on a horizontal plane, came straight down, went on a horizontal, he said without friction, that ball would roll on forever. He was ahead of his time here. 
but the ball will eventually come to rest. And it's not due to its nature to come to rest, right? It's not saying the ball is going to come to rest five miles down the road because that's its nature to go to. But it's because of friction. Friction is going to slowly build up in the ball and slow it down, right? If we didn't have friction, on the other hand, with cars, we wouldn't be able to stop. That would be a bad thing. So the ball is really slow down one plane, would usually reach about the same height on the other side. So if you moved it up further up the plane on this side, it would reach further up the plane on this side. If you moved it lower, it only reached here, right? It wasn't like if you rolled it down low, it would roll all the way up to the other side. That's kind of not the way it worked. Now, could we do that? Well, maybe if we reduce the friction on this side over here, it might change it, right? But the ball tended to attain the same height even when the second plane was longer and the incline was smaller angle than the first plane, right? This helped him determine this idea of friction and inertia, right? And came along Sir Isaac Newton and he homogenized some of the previous research on motion, right? You often hear about him getting hit in the head with an apple, right? And coming up with a theory of gravity. We'll talk about free fall in a little bit. We started doing heavy research on motion, produced a few of the basic laws that we still are supported today. Newton's first law, the law of inertia, is a restatement of Galileo's idea that a force is not needed to keep an object in motion, right? Objects at rest, we talked about, tend to stay at rest. Objects in motion tend to stay in motion. Simply put, objects tend to keep on doing what they're already doing, right? If it's at rest, it stays at rest. If that motion, It'll keep in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. This is the big thing. Objects at rest tends to stay at rest. Objects in motion tend to stay in motion unless acted upon by some outside force. Right? In total absence of forces, a moving object tends to move in a straight line indefinitely. We go up to the USS Space Station, right? Or I don't think it's USS, but the International Space Station. And we go out for a spacewalk and we take a baseball and we chuck it, right? That force that we're going to impart upon that baseball will go on forever. It'll go through space because there's no real friction acting upon it. The only time that that would stop is if it encountered another object like a comet. Um, maybe we threw it towards Mars and so it hits the asteroid belt. Or maybe suddenly, you know, a little gray, gray alien ship comes along and it bounces off the ship. That would be needed to change its inertia. Otherwise, it'll go on forever. Theoretically, if we throw that and it hits nothing, it will leave our galaxy and it'll go further on the unit. So maybe enter three, four, five other galaxies if it hits nothing. You know, unless it comes to a galaxy where there's air in its area, then that could change things and friction could occur. So an object at rest tends to stay at rest, an object in motion tends to stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. This can even relate to studying, going to the gym, simply getting out of bed. Think about it, if you go to the gym, when you're starting to go to the gym, at first it's really difficult your resistance or your inertia to going to the gym is high. But as you continue to build kind of regimen and you're going to the gym daily or every other day or every three days, whatever you're doing, it becomes easier to continue to go. This legitimately supports this law of inertia. Studying is another great example. When you first start studying, it's really, really difficult to start studying. But the longer you do it and the better you kind of create your plan, the better that you create your idea of how to study, it gets a lot easier to study. And you set your regimen, I'm going to study from three to five o'clock every day. And you know, I set these regimens up. It's a lot easier to keep doing that. And it's a lot harder to become kind of sidetracked. But the same thing can happen, like going to the gym, right? You miss one appointment, going to the gym. It gets easier to miss that next appointment. It gets easier to miss that next appointment, right? That's the law of reverse inertia, right? things will start to return back to rest unless you keep acting on it by that outside force. You throw a ball up in a car, right? If the law of inertia didn't exist, when you throw that ball up, you'd not be able to catch it in the same spot. It would fly backwards and land in the back seat, take something in the back seat or bounce off the back window. But because of the law of inertia, that ball is moving at the same speed the car is moving, the same speed you are moving, because it's gained inertia, and you throw it up, you're able to catch it right back, right? You're able to just kind of go whoop and catch it and catch it Whoop, and catch it. And it makes sense because the earth is moving. Right now we're hurtling through space, right? And like 10,000 some odd meters per second or something weird like that, I got that coming up. But let's say that we didn't have the law of inertia. If you threw this simple Oakley bag up, it hit the next person behind me. I wouldn't be able to sit here at rest because I'd be constantly pulling some Gs here, right? But we have this law of inertia. 
So the force of gravity between the sun and this planet holds all the planets in this orbit around the sun, right? The sun has a massive amount of mass, right? That's how we know it's Catholic because it has a lot of mass, right? Um, just joking, ha, 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 right? So what happens? What if the sun suddenly goes black on us and collapses in on itself like a neutron? A uh, neutron, um, like a black hole. Sun collapses in on itself, the gravity is gone. What will happen to the Earth if all of a sudden we lose the gravitational attraction to the sun? First of all, it's going to be a bad day for us if we lose the sun, because that's our source of all of our energy, right? We're going to talk about that in energy. But the Earth is going to continue going on the path that it was going forever, and which means we're going to fly away from the sun. We're going to fly away from all the planets. We're just going to keep going in the straight line, the direction we were going at the time that the sun lost its gravitational pull. You know, let's say that we lose the gravitational pull here on Earth. Suddenly, the Earth's core stops spinning. I think they did a whole movie on that. I think it was called The Core or something like that. Suddenly, the Earth stops spinning. Well, that means all of the gases that surround the Earth that make up our atmosphere are no longer going to be attracted to the core of the Earth. One of those big things, right? is that ozone layer that we have that protects us from space radiation. That's gonna be free. It's gonna travel away from the earth. Now that layer is no longer there. That means all that solar radiation that's blocked is now gonna come pummeling down on us and literally cook us like a microwave, right? Worse than that, you know, we're gonna start losing the ability for water to be attracted there. So the water is gonna kind of lift up off the earth. We will eventually lift up off the earth at a time because we will lose that gravitational attraction to the center of the earth. It will be a bad day for us. We'll become much like other planets where maybe our mass is not attracted to the Earth as much and we theoretically could just jump and fly off the planet into space forever. That, you know, it's kind of scary thought. So, you know, the other thing, what happens to the moon at that point? What if the mass, center of the mass of the Earth shifts ever so slightly and now it doesn't have enough gravitational pull to maintain the orbit of the moon? Well, let's hope that it goes that way because then the moon's going to fly off. We're going to lose things like the tides, which the moon is really important for. We'll lose a lot of other things as well. But the moon will fly off. Worse yet is what happens if the Earth's gravitational pull gets greater. You know, even a slight change where it pulls that moon a little bit closer and a little bit closer every year is eventually going to become catastrophic for us. Right? So the more mass an object has, the greater its inertia and the more force it takes to change its state of motion. Right? You guys can take, and if you have a ball, let's just say you have a really huge ball, a seven foot diameter ball, and you push it. It may take a little bit of force to push it, right? It may take a little bit to overcome the inertia, but it'll eventually roll. Now let's change that and make that a seven foot diameter ball of lead. Mm, probably aren't going to push it. Right? So that's the kind of idea. The more mass an object has, the greater amount of force is going to require to change its inertia, change its motion, right? The mass then, therefore, is a measurement of the inertia of an object, right? So let's just say you have a 200 pound person. A 200 pound person is going to have a greater mass than a 100 pound person. That's measurement of mass. That means that the 200 pound person has a greater inertia than the 100 pound person. Yeah, it's also gonna not have, but it's gonna have a harder time slowing down, harder time speeding up, everything like that, right? Think about tractor trailer trucks. It's a lot harder to start them going down the road and a lot harder to stop them than say something like a Kia Rio or something to that effect, right? Don't confuse mass with volume. Volume is a measurement of space something takes up and is measuring as like cubic centimeters, cubic meters and liters. It's not the same. Two people can have the exact same mass and take up a lot different spaces. Uh, I, I, you know, you, you look at certain people and I sometimes when they say, you know, especially when I'm watching like football or something like that. And I see these guys and I'm like, this guy weighs blah, blah, blah pounds. And I'm like, holy crap, he is super dense and super, you know, it doesn't have a huge waist like I have weighs less than I do and or weighs more than I do and has a better physique than I do. Well, yeah, his mass and I are the same, 
but our volume, the amount of space that we take up is totally different because our body makeup is different. Right? Maybe he has a lot more um, muscle than I have, who knows, bones are dense, I, whatever, anyway. So mass, when we're talking about science, it's fundamental unit of kilograms or just grams or anything like that. So then we're talking about the kind of standard methods of weight that we deal with in the United States. That means mass would be measured in pounds. But we're not gonna talk about that in this class. It's gonna be measured in grams, kilograms, something to that effect. And again, it is the amount of matter that makes up the idea, right? So which has more mass here, a feather pillow or a common automobile battery, right? Well, obviously the automobile battery is more difficult to set in motion. That's an evidence that it has a greater inertia and has a greater mass. Even if that pillow is a giant, huge, full body pillow, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have less mass than that tightly compacted lead cell battery, right? Now, if they both came in the same mass, so both came in weighing at 20 to 8 kilograms, then at that point, would they have more mass or inertia? Well, no, they'd be equal because at that point, their masses are the same. Their volumes are going to be definitely different, but their masses are going to be the same. Mass is often confused with weight, right? We often determine the amount of matter in an object by measuring its gravitational attraction to Earth. However, mass is more fundamental than weight. So mass is a measurement of the amount of material in an object. Weight, on the other hand, is a measurement of the gravitational force acting upon the object. Most of our scales nowadays measure our gravitational pull of the body, right? And then do the math to convert it back to mass. Because let's just think about it. If you weighed 120 kilograms, right? So that's about 250 pounds, right? Your true gravitational pull towards Earth would be 1,200 newtons. And telling somebody, oh, you're, you weigh 1,200 newtons would, you know, nowadays at least, would completely destroy somebody's whole mindset. You know, if you weighed 100 kilograms, which is 220 pounds, you'd weigh a thousand, you're technically being pulled down at a thousand newtons of force. Even if you weighed something, let's just say you're a hundred pound soaking wet person. At that point, you're 50 kilograms ish, right? That means we would say that you're 500 newtons of weight. That doesn't sound as good, right? People don't like big numbers. The bigger the number, the more upset they get, right? That just tells us that you're gaining weight and you don't want that. So that's why we kind of convert it automatically back to units of mass. Now, let's say that we have, two, again, we have two people. Two people weigh the exact same. They both weigh 150 pounds. So about 75, 75, 72 ish kilograms. Does that mean they have the same molecular makeup? No. It just means when you're looking at the mass and the amount of the, the amount of stuff there, the mass is the same. You know, they may have more carbon chains, may have nitrogen chains, those are a little differently, but the mass itself is going to equate out. So mass is inertia, right? The amount of material in a particular stone is the same whether the stone's located on Earth, the moon, or outer space, right? It doesn't matter. We have a five pound block of lead right? It's still five pounds on Earth. It's still five pounds on the moon. It's still five pounds on Mars, right? Let's just talk about kilos of that. Let's say a 10 kilogram ball of lead. A 10 kilograms is 10 kilograms here on Earth, moon, Mars, outer space, doesn't matter, right? The mass of that is the same in all locations. The weight of the stone would be very different on Earth than it would be in space, right? It could even be different going from something like New Orleans, where it's at sea level, and going to Denver, where it's not at sea level. Right, Mile High Stadium. That city now has a totally different meaning to that term, doesn't it? Anyway, so stones inertia mass, that hasn't changed. The location has changed. The, the molecular makeup hasn't changed. The same force would still be required to shake the stone with the same rhythm, whether the stone was in Earth, the moon, or wherever force-free area, right? Its mass is gonna be the same. Now, let's say we go to somewhere like Mars. Um, and I, um, if you, again, I'm going to recommend this. If you haven't watched the series, The Expanse on Amazon Prime, it was originally a sci-fi series, but I highly recommend it. Um, the Expanse talks about having people on different areas in space, right? We have Earthers, we have people that live on the moon, which are still considered Earthers. We have Belters, people that live in the asteroid belt. And then we have people living on a bunch of different planets, including Mars. And it does a really good job of talking about the physics of what would happen to the human body 
if we developed in space. So if you're born in space from birth, where you're at, you know, less than a full G, which is the gravitational pull of Earth, your body would develop totally differently. Your bones would expand, right? They become more airy, meaning there would be more air and space in that soft tissue of the bone, right? The bones themselves will lengthen. They become more brittle, easier to break, right? Taking you from space and bringing you back down to earth would be enough to make you very nauseated and sick because that pull of the earth would actually hurt your bones. You'd probably survive a little bit better on something like um, the moon because the moon doesn't have the same gravitational pull as earth, right? But the moon still has a gravitational pull or Mars. So that's kind of the idea here is that mass, but if we look at somebody that's maybe born on Mars versus born on the earth, their masses are gonna be the same if they're the exact same 200 kilograms or whatever, 100 kilograms. But the weight pulling them on each of those planets is gonna be vastly different. So we can define mass and weight as follows. Mass is the quantity of stuff in the object, matter in the object. It's the measure of the inertia or laziness of the object, right? It's response to either move or stop or start it. Weight is just that force of gravity on us, right? You, so theoretically, if you wanted to lose weight, you could go to the moon. You could go to Denver, you'd lose weight. Scales though in Denver are gonna auto calibrate though and change your mass. So if you're hoping, oh, I'll go there and I may weigh 200 pounds here, but if I go to Denver, it's only gonna show 198. No, they're gonna calibrate the scale so that it still zeroes out and tears out, right? So mass and weight are proportional to each other in places though. This is interesting. In the same location, twice the mass usually weighs twice as much. The mass and weight are proportional to each other, but they're not equal. We learned before one kilo, right? Of one kilogram is about 2.2 pounds. So then one kilogram is pulled to earth with 10 Newtons of force at sea level. And then therefore also we know that 2.2 pounds is pulled to earth with 10 Newtons of force at sea level because 2.2 and one kilogram pounds equivalent to one kilogram. The further you move away from the Earth's core, the force becomes less. To us, not necessarily by a noticeable amount. I mean, I guess maybe if you climb up Kilimanjaro or, you know, you climb up a super high mountain like Mount Rainier, I'm guessing you would feel different in weight at those locations, but I'm pretty confident the other problems you'd be encountering, the lower oxygen content, stuff like that, would make up for you ever feeling lighter at that point. So I don't think you'd notice so much, oh, I feel so much lighter now, um, because now you'd be wearing, you know, wearing twice as much clothing. Maybe come when you get up there that you're able to carry that better, possibly. Um, I don't know what the, that's an interesting thought. I've never gone that high, so I can't tell you. I keep seeing flickers and flashes and it's driving me nuts. Oh, it's a uh, camera refocusing. Okay. So, when you're on the Earth, the Earth is moving at 30 kilometers per second, right? So that Earth is constantly moving at 30 kilometers per second. Think about that. 30 kilometers per second is how fast you're moving right now. But so is everything else. Tree, road, bird, you, even the air between us is moving at 30 kilometers per second. So the objects on Earth move with Earth as Earth moves around the sun. That's why everything to us appears to be at rest. Right? When we describe the motion of one object with respect to another, we say the object is moving relative to the other object. If I throw this right now, this is going to move relative to me. Right? If we look at a book that's at rest relative to the table it's on, it's still moving 30 kilometers per second relative to the sun. Excuse me. Um, book moves even faster relative to the center of gravity or galaxy as well, right? The space shuttle moves about eight kilometers per second relative to the Earth below. So it's moving at a high period of speed. Why doesn't, it, why doesn't it burn up when it's up in space? Well, because there's no friction to cause it to burn up. A racing car, an Indy 500, reaches speeds of about 300 kilometers per hour relative to the track, right? And then if you figure out the Earth, man, it's even moving faster, right? But unless otherwise stated, the speed of things in our environment are measured relative to the surface of the Earth. Right? When you are driving down the road, your speedometer tells you your relative speed related to the Earth. It's not telling you relative speed related to the sun or to the moon. It's telling you related to Earth. 
So although you may be at rest relative to your surface, you're moving about 100,000 kilometers per hour relative to the sun. Again, still flying along. This comes into play when we discuss speed, right? Speed is not a drug. That's not what we're talking about. That's pharmacology when we get there. We're talking about the distance an object travels based upon its time. So before the time of Galileo, people described things moving as simply being slow or fast. Those descriptions are pretty vague, right? We need to be able to calculate an object's speed. And Galileo is credited with the first to measure speed by considering distance versus the time it takes. So the formula for speed is speed equals distance over time. We're going to talk about velocity coming up in a few seconds here. But a lot of times we're just going to say the same thing with velocity. Velocity equals distance over time, right? So if you go to, I don't know, let's say you go from the school over to Summerlin Hospital. It's about 15 miles to get there, I think, is if I remember correctly. I'm just going to go with that number. If it takes you an hour to travel that 15 miles, because this is Vegas, that means your speed would have been 15 miles per or every hour, which would be considered a back in the Galileo's time pretty fast. But now we know it's kind of slow, right? That means the traffic impeded you and everything else. So speed is the how fast an object is moving. When you look down at your speedometer on your car, it is talking about your instantaneous speed. It's looking at how fast you're going right now. Right? And when we have speed limits, speed limits are suggested law speeds that are safe to travel on the road. So when it says 75 miles an hour, legitimately what it's saying is it should be safe for you to travel 75 miles an hour down this road. Now you get a road like where I, you know, back on the East Coast, so I love to travel on, which is called, there's a place called the Dragon. If you ever get a chance to look it up, look it up. It's in the, on the border between Tennessee and North Carolina. I want to say it has 311 turns and 11 miles or something like that. It's crazy. Fantastic road to drive on if you love driving. If you get car sick, the worst place in the world. Um, my ex-wife, oh my God, like my car was filled with puke. Um, for me, it was a lot of fun. I love taking my WRX and taking it around those, uh, those corners. And I broke the bike out and took the bike around those corners. It was a ton of fun right? But there's no way those roads with that many corners could be relegated and said, oh, well, we're going to, you know, we're going to say that it's safe to drive 75 miles an hour on those corners, right? Most of the area was like a speed, speed, uh, uh, speed limit of 20 to 25 miles per hour, which is what everyone obeyed going around those corners completely. Right? But what they're saying is if you go over 20 miles an hour, it's not safe for every person and every car. So we have to base our speed limits based upon how safe it is for the least safe vehicle. Tractor trailer trucks. You know, you're not going to take a tractor trailer truck around those corners. I saw one going through that. That was a nightmare and terrifying. I don't know why the guy went that way. He was trying to save time and ended up jackknifing halfway down one of the mountain roads. Right? So speed is distance over time. So any combination units for distance time can be useful. Miles per hour, kilometers per hour, centimeters per day, light years per century, right? We'll eventually talk about traveling light years in a certain amount of time. Um, light years per century, hopefully that's, you know, that's, that's hopefully we can travel faster than that, but we don't know, right? Getting to another galaxy, it may take four generations of human beings to get somewhere. meaning they have to put people in these transitional space pods that are going to breed, have kids, so those kids can eventually take over the shuttle so they can have kids, so they can take, you know, that's the type of idea we're thinking about for interstellar travel, right? When we talk about physics, we usually use the standard meters per second for speed, like a cheetah. The cheetah travels 50 meters in about two seconds. Its speed would be 25 meters per second. And here's some just common speeds, right? Bowling ball is about six meters per second. Very good sprinter, about 11 meters per second. Sprinting rabbit, 17 meters per second. Tsunami, 22 meters per second. Sprinting cheetah, 28 meters per second. The average, about 60 miles an hour. Think about that. Batted softball, about 75 miles per hour, about 33 meters per second. Batted baseball, 100 meters miles per hour, 44 meters per second. 
just some example speeds. No, you do not have to know these. So that's what we talked about. Car does not, when you're traveling, car doesn't always move at the same speed. And you're driving from here to school or school to home or whatever it is. You're not always traveling at whatever the speedometer says. You're not always going 60 miles an hour. If you were, you'd be a maniac, right? But that just tells you the speed at that instant looking at it, right? If you look at your speed when you're on the I-15 and then look at it while you're on eastbound Flamingo, it's a totally different number, right? Because those are totally different roads and traffic levels are totally different. Well, we do look at the average speed, right? In any car trip, car will not only travel at the same speed, but their car won't travel the same speed the whole trip, right? But, you know, me particularly, I am really big on looking at the average speed of my trip. How fast was I going when I travel? I don't know why I do this. I think I'm pretty confident it's a male thing. Um, I question if everyone says that or not, but I, my ex used to talk to me all the time about not figuring this out. Um, the average speed is the, average, the, the total distance divided by the total time you travel. So if you traveled 90 miles and it took you 90 minutes, right? Well, then you'd be going about a mile a minute, right? Uh, I'll never forget one of the trips I took. I traveled from Washington, D.C., and we were going down to Kings Dominion. Actually, I was coming from Pennsylvania, but it was the Washington, D.C. when I got into the kind of trouble. Um, so we're going to Washington, D.C. We're staying outside of Richmond in this little city called Ashland, Virginia. And I got hooked up with a bunch of other cars. I, there were two WRXs, which if you guys know cars, pretty quick little car. Um, there was a Skyline, a couple of Mustangs, and we got hooked up right outside of D.C. My ex-wife was asleep in the car. Her, her sister was in the back along with her sister's boyfriend. They both, they all passed out at this point. I was driving us overnight. And I'll never forget, I made it from DC to Ashland in about 55 minutes. Don't figure that out. That was very bad of me. Um, but we get there and she's like, oh, I, I, just, I just laid down, we're in DC. I'm like, yeah, we made good time, right? So the average speed is that total distance, right? If you're traveling to Pahrump, you would know the distance you traveled and how long it took you to get there and you could calculate your average speed. And depending upon traffic, it may be good, right? Average speed, I've driven down to LA a few times now. I always make really good average speed getting to the outskirts of LA. And then my average speed tanks because about that time. Or, you know, you get over the, the pass and you get to like Barstow or something like that. And there's construction, everything's down to one lane. And there goes your average speed, right? But it's just kind of looking at that time it takes you to get somewhere versus that distance you covered. That average speed is often quite distant, different from the instantaneous speed, right? If you're traveling at 75 miles an hour, when you look down at your speedometer, you're not going to be at that same 75 miles an hour the whole way down to LA. It's just not going to happen. If you think it is, you haven't encountered LA traffic yet or the LAPD. You know, whether we talk about average speed or instantaneous speed, we're talking about the rates that distance is traveled. If we know the average speed and the travel time, the distance is easily defined, right? Total distance covered equals the average speed times the travel time. So if your average speed is 80 kilometers per hour on a four hour trip, you've covered about 320 kilometers, right? So it's pretty easy to calculate this type of stuff out. So here's the deal. And I forgot to mention this when we hit our first formula here, right? Speed equals distance over time. And then we have this one here, average speed equals total distance covered over total time. When you get problems from me on this, you will be given at least two of the, like in this case, we have three variables, average speed, total distance, time interval. You'll be given two of those variables and asked to solve for the third. It's up to you to be able to do the algebra. I may give you average speed. I may give you total distance covered and ask you for the time interval. I may give you total distance and time interval and ask you for the average speed. All it is is plugging those numbers into the formula, okay? I would suggest taking a three by five note card at this point and putting these formulas on the three by five note card. If you were in physical class with me, you would be able to bring that note card to your test. You're gonna be sitting at home. I would suggest having that note card there because not all of my questions are gonna have all of the formulas on them because part of learning physics is learning which formulas to apply. If I ask you for distance and I give you an average speed and a time interval, you should be able to calculate that for me is just plugging part A in for part B and getting part C. 
So velocity, the difference between velocity and speed, speed would be a scalar, it's just a number, whereas velocity would be a vector, it's a number with a direction, right, it is known as directed speed. Speed is a description of how fast an object moves, velocity is how fast an object moves and in what direction. And in philosophy, yeah, philosophy <laughs> physics, velocity is speed in a direction. We say the car travels at six kilometers per hour, we're talking about speed. We say it's 60 kilometers per hour to the north, we're specifying velocity. Constant speed means steady speed. Something with constant speed doesn't always, doesn't speed up or slow down. Constant velocity though means constant speed and constant direction, meaning if you change directions, you change velocity. You may not necessarily change the speed, but you've changed velocity. Constant direction in a straight line, so constant velocity means motion in a straight line at a constant speed, meaning if you want to say the object has a constant velocity, it would have to travel in the same direction at the same speed. Great example, that would be the baseball in space, right? Once I throw it, it's going to have a direction and maybe I mean, the direction may be away from me. That's a direction. I throw a baseball at, you know, 65 miles an hour away from me. That would be the velocity of that baseball, right? Now that that baseball's velocity is going to stay constant in space because there's nothing acting upon it until it hits something. Then the velocity is going to change. It's never going to slow down because there's no air resistance in space. So constant speed and constant velocity are not always the same, right? A body may move at a constant speed along a curved path, right? But that doesn't mean it's moving at a constant velocity because direction is changing every instant. So below, I've got a picture of Martinsville, which is the race that we just happened this weekend, right? The cars are going around the NASCAR track. They may have consistent speeds or constant speeds, right? They may travel at 85 miles an hour around that whole track. They don't. They slow down and speed up in the corners. But we're just going to say they're able to hold that speed um, through the whole thing. Better yet, better would probably be something like Daytona or, you know, one of the big track, one of the super speedways like um, Darlington or something to that effect. At that point, they may be able to maintain constant speeds, but because they're always going to the left, right? That's a big joke in NASCAR. They're making a left turn, making another left turn. Because they are making those turns, they're not traveling at a constant velocity. They're constantly going around. If you have somebody that follows road course racing and like, like 24 hours of Le Mans or something like that, those cars may have a constant speed going around the track. They're not gonna have a constant velocity because they're constantly changing directions, right? Even a drag strip, right? If you have somebody drag race and you're, you go watch um, Street Outlaws or something like that, that does, those cars don't have a constant velocity because in the initial, they're speeding up. Now, at one point, at some point, they will have a constant velocity where they can't go any faster and they're traveling at that speed straight down that road. But then they're going to have to slow down in order to not kind of wreck. Yes, I'm a redneck. I even watch those shows because they're hilarious to me. Street cars, those are not street cars and street outlaws get real. Um, anyway, acceleration is the rate at which velocity is changing, right? When you accelerate, you're speeding up. Well, also in physics, we're going to talk at slowing down as well. It's just a positive or a negative acceleration. You can calculate the acceleration of an object by dividing the change in velocity over time, right? We can also change the state of emotion by changing its speed, direction, or both. So in physics, the term acceleration applies to decreases as well as increases in speed. The brakes in your, brakes, the brakes in your car can produce a large retarding acceleration. That is, they decrease your average speed per second, right? We usually call it deceleration in cars, right, or slowing down. In physics, it's just negative acceleration. You have positive acceleration speeding up, negative acceleration slowing down, right? Acceleration though, is a because it's dealing with velocity, can also apply to change in direction. So theoretically, if you change from going west to east, you technically accelerate it. It's a change, right? It's important to distinguish though between that speed and velocity. Acceleration is defined as the rate of change in velocity, not the change in speed. Acceleration, like velocity, is a vector quantity because it is directional. So look in the following graphics down here, right? These pictures. We have a couple of different examples of the first one, the car is speeding up, right? That is positive acceleration. 
The second picture, right? The one in the middle here, we got the car slowing down, right? Or a negative acceleration. In the third picture, we have a couple of different things, right? We have the car speeding up, trying to slow down, not able to slow down the whole time. And now we've got the oh crap acceleration because it's changing direction, it's now falling. That is still a change in acceleration or a change in velocity, right? So when straight line motion is considered, meaning moving in a straight line, talking about like drag strips, talking about sprints, it's common to use speed and velocity interchangeably because the direction is not changing a straight line. Right? When the direction is not changing, acceleration may be expressed in the rate at which speed changes. So speed and velocity are measured in units of distance per time. Acceleration is a change in velocity or speed per time interval. Uh, it's usually speeds per time. We talked about that already. Changing speeds without changing directions, right? From going from zero to 10 kilometers per hour in one second produces a change in the rate of speed at 10 kilometers per sec hour second, right? So there's going to be two units of time when we're talking about acceleration because there's going to be one unit of time in the, the speed, right? In this case, our speed. 10 kilometers per hour, there's our unit of time. And then we have a time interval down here to change that, right? So we've got a second, that's our second time interval. So acceleration at the point would be 10 kilometers per hour second, right? You may have meters squared. We're gonna talk about that in a bit, right? What we're gonna talk about is straight line falling. Catch me now, I'm falling. Imagine we have no air resistance and that gravity is the only thing affecting a falling object. An object moving under the influence of gravitational pull is said to be in free fall. The elapsed time that of time that has elapsed or passed since the beginning of motion in this case would be caused to fall. The acceleration of an object in free fall is about 10 meters per second squared, right? During this time, I don't know why I've got to fix that. It's seconds S2, that should be seconds squared. I didn't move that to superscript, I apologize. During the second of free fall, the instantaneous speed of the object increases for every 10 meters per second it's traveling. This gain in speed is the acceleration. When the change in speed is in the meters per second and the interval is an additional second, the acceleration will be in meters per second squared. So the unit of time the second occurs twice for the unit of speed and then again for the unit of time of change. Well, why is this important? Because this gives us a gravitational constant G, right? And this is the OG, yo. This is the OG. This is the acceleration of an object due to gravity. So that's why we don't use G a lot in mathematics, because G is the acceleration of gravity. Though it varies slightly in different parts of the world, the average value is nearly 10 meters per second squared. Where accuracy is important, it's usually 9.8 meters per second squared. But again, this class, I'm going to make it easy. Please just make it easy on yourself. Remember the 10 meters per second squared. That means we can calculate the instantaneous speed of an object in free fall, right? By multiplying its acceleration times the elapsed time. So we have here V equals GT. What this is literally saying is velocity equals acceleration times time. Just in this case, the acceleration is going down. So therefore, because that acceleration is going down, right? we know that the acceleration down is 10 meters per second squared. Right? So V is used to both represent speed and velocity. At that point, the velocity is going down. We do have a direction. right? G is at 10 meters per second squared. So let's look at this. Let's say we have an object that is falling in free fall with no effects from gravity for two seconds. Can we calculate what its velocity would be at that two second mark? Yes, we know the time, two seconds. We know the acceleration, again, V equals AT, that, right? In this case, the A is this gravitational constant G. So we can come over here and go, right? We can go V equals, GT and go V equals gravitational constant 10 meters per second squared times the time two seconds. So velocity is in that point is going to come out to be 20 meters per second. At that given moment, two seconds into it, 
that object is traveling 20 meters per second. Well, what happens at three seconds? Well, now it's traveling at 30 meters per second. What happens at five seconds? Well, now it's traveling at 50 meters per second. So that's going to constantly change the faster an object's going, right? So at zero seconds, it's got no speed, right? Ten, at one second, we're traveling 10 meters per second, two seconds, 20 meters per second, three seconds, 30 meters per second. So we're constantly increasing in free fall, right? That also means that we're going to fall farther distances the longer we are falling. And you can kind of figure that out. If you jump out of an airplane, the longer you are in free fall, the faster you're going to feel yourself going. Right. And then if you pull a chute, the harder it's going to be to slow you down. Right. If you wait till 20 feet above the ground to pull your chute, you're probably going to become a road pizza. Right. But if you pull a chute at an appropriate height, the chute is going to be able to help slow you down. But even if you pull it too early, the chute may not be able to fully slow you down enough to not cause injury when you land. So there's specific times to pull chutes and all that fun stuff. I always question why you'd want to jump out. Of a perfectly good airplane, but hey, that kind of is the whole military, isn't it? So let's say we're talking about somebody jumping out of an airplane, right? And we know that it, you know, they jump out of an airplane and we don't even have to have the height, but we want to know how fast they're going to be going once they've been falling for 15 seconds. And well, we know Right? We can figure that out because if we know that V equals GT and we know that G is the gravitational constant, so we're going 10 meters per second squared, and we know they're traveling for 15 seconds, we know that at the point of that 15 seconds, they are now traveling at 150 meters per second. That's pretty darn fast, right? Now let's just extrapolate a little bit here. Are they going to be going further, a farther distance at that point than they were at the first second? Yeah, right. It's going to increase exponentially the faster they're going. Right. So at the first first second, they only fall about ten meters. Right. Well, when they're at that hundred and fifty meter second for every second, they're falling one hundred and fifty meters. That means Earth is coming up. Right. And you're going to be high speed dirt really soon. So what happens when I throw an object up into the air? Well, it moves upward for a while, right? This is a great example. It moves upward for a while and then comes back down, right? At some point, when it reaches its apex, the highest point it's at, I like throwing stuff up in the air. At some point, it's going to travel until its instantaneous speed is zero. At that point, it's going to start falling back to the ground, right? During the upward part of the motion, the object's going to slow from its upward velocity to zero. Well, how much is it going to slow? Well, we can calculate that because we know that the gravity is pulling it down at 10 meters per second per second. So we know that it's going to slow down at that same speed. So it's going to slow down at G, right? If I only throw it up at 10 meters per second squared, it's only going to take one second to slow down to zero. And then it's going to fall back down at 10 meters per second squared. So it'll take about two seconds to make that travel. Well, this is important, especially in my area, because we have rednecks, and we often don't think about it. We have we all have that Uncle Bob back where I'm from that decides on 4th of July, he's going to go out and shoot his gun off into the space, because that bullet's going to get to space. Well, Uncle Bob doesn't think very much about that, and he'll shoot off that bullet and may travel at 1,500 meters per second. It's going to keep traveling upwards, and that gravity is going to pull down on it 10 meters per second second. So 10 meters per second squared for all the time it's traveling up. And it's going to reach an apex where its speed eventually becomes zero. Well, what happens at that minute, that time with the bullet? Well, at that point, for one brief second, it's frozen in space. And then it's going to start falling back down. And for every second it falls, it's going to be falling faster and faster and faster, right? Until it reaches a speed where it could be lethal. And so, you know, Bob's sitting there and he shoots a C, it went off into space. And 25 seconds later, or however long it takes, all of a sudden a bullet goes through Bob's hand. Who shot me? Well, Bob, you just shot yourself, you idiot. Um, I'm actually speaking from experience. 
I had an uncle do this and the bullet went through his foot. And I'm not even joking about this. He thought somebody shot him. These are the same people that believe in flat earth. Um, anyway, but you know, no amount of convincing Uncle Bob was going to tell him wasn't named Uncle Bob, mind you. I'm just going to use that as an example. Uh, no amount of convincing was convincing Uncle Bob that was his bullet. That was the commie shooting him from Russia. Needless to say, Uncle Bob had some issues. Um, but when you think about that, you know, what goes up must come down, right? Let's say you're at the top of the Empire State Building, right? So you're at the very tippy top of the Empire State Building. Um, let me take a look here. How tall is the Empire State Building? It is, so it is a total of 1,250 feet tall. So let's convert that to meters. So 1,250, uh, divide by three. So it's about 400 meters high. That seems off. I don't know if you're right. Hey Siri, how tall is the Empire State Building in meters? The Empire State Building is 1,457 feet tall. Convert 1,457 feet to meters. 444.09 meters. All right, there we go. So it's about 444 meters high. So you're up that high and you drop a penny. For every second that that penny falls, now there is some air resistance, but it, we're just going to consider it in free fall here. For every second that penny falls, it's going to be picking up speed, right? At first, first second, it's going 10 meters per second, 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 20 meters per second, third, 30 meters per second. At 10 seconds, it's going 100 meters per second, right? It's going to fall down for a certain amount of time. Eventually, it's going to hit bottom. Hopefully, it doesn't hit a person because that person, it could literally go down and split them right down through the center, right? So this is why they don't let you throw stuff off of, you know, roller coasters. Why it's also good for or, or throw stuff off of buildings. Why it's also good that a lot of roller coasters kind of go over parts of the park where people aren't walking, right? Because even vomit coming out of somebody's mouth, if it comes out of their mouth at enough speed plus also height can be dangerous or wallets, pens, you know, French fries, I don't know. So how far does an object fall in the first second? Well, right at the end of the first second, the falling object has an instantaneous speed of 10 meters per second. The initial speed was zero meters per second. The average speed at that point is five meters per second. Then for during the first second, the object has an average speed of five meters per second falling about five second or five meters. For each second of free fall, the object is going to fall a greater distance, which we just talked about, right? Because the speed's improving. When we talk about distance in mathematical terms, we're going to use the term, the letter D for distance. So we're going to try to figure out the D, right? So distance equals one half GT squared, right? So let's just use that Empire State Building as a great example, right? Because we know we're gonna just gonna even it out here. We're gonna say that the Empire State Building is 400 meters high. We can actually calculate how long it's gonna take for that to fall until it hits the ground. So we know the distance, right? The distance is 400 meters. We have one half. We know the constant G, right? 10 meters per second squared. And then we have time squared expand this so that it doesn't do that weird thing. All right. So we now have 400 meters equals five meters per second. I just got rid of that half and multiplied them together. Just time squared, right? 
Well, now how we solve this? Well, we divide both sides by five, right? Because that'll get rid of that five meters per second. So 400 meters divided by five meters per second squared equals five. Five by five. This is, I'm just writing it all out here so it's clear to what I'm doing. Why did I put four? I meant five there. My bad. Oh my God, my fingers. So in this case, those five meters per second squared are going to cancel out on the right side. And we have this over here. So 400 divided by five is what? 80, right? So we got rid of our meters because the meters are canceling out, right? So we have seconds squared as our time equals time squared. So 80 meters, it's, it's taken 80 seconds to fall. Well, not really because we have to square root it now, right? So we have to go the square root of 80, right? Uh, let me turn my calculator out here, here, 80. And where's my square root button? square root. So it took about, well, it, I mean, that's logical. If I didn't think about this, right? It took about nine seconds to fall to Earth. So think about that. That's how long it took to fall. It was nine seconds. Oh boy. Can we calculate its speed at the time of hitting the Earth at that point? Can we? Yeah, because we have got another formula we can toss in there, don't we? Because now we've got, let me go back over here and change my drawing, right? We also have this formula here, V equals GT. So we can figure out how fast it's going at that nine second mark. So we can come down here and go V equals GT. There we go. Velocity equals 10 meters per second squared. Time, we know that it traveled nine seconds about. So that means the time, the point that it hits the Earth, it's traveling at 90 meters per second. Okay. So we just calculate that. So at 90 meters per second, I'm going to clear all these drawings real quick. And let's go back up a few slides. So it's traveling at 90 meters per second. Let's go up here. Where was that speech chart? Back a little ways here. So there's our speed chart, right? It's traveling at 90 meters per second, which is more than double the speed of a batted baseball. Is that gonna hurt if that hits somebody? Darn tootin' it's gonna, right? And you figure that's double, it's probably traveling at about 200 miles per hour. That's your penny you dropped off the top of the Empire State Building. That's going to create some damage. Even though the concrete below, once it hits, it's still going to create some damage. So that's why you don't throw things off building, children. That's all I'm saying, right? Don't go up to the top of the uh, stratosphere and throw stuff off, right? So we can use free falling objects describing the relation for distance travel, velocity, everything. I can give you different variables. And as long as I give you enough to fill out, I can give you acceleration, I can give you time. If I give you acceleration, I give you time, you should be able to tell me the velocity or the distance, right? Because all you do is plug them in. If I give you a distance, you should be able to calculate stuff like acceleration or time, right? So all of that comes into play. You just plug these variables in. So again, take out your little note card, right? Get a little three by five, five by seven. I usually say three by five, but I can't check it nowadays. So it can be any size number. It could be a sheet of paper if you just want to do a sheet of paper put these formulas on it, right? We're gonna have more, we're gonna have mass equals, uh, or force equals mass times acceleration coming up, we're gonna have a couple of different ones. So drop a feather and a coin. Like we go to the top again, stratosphere, toss a feather and a coin off the top of the stratosphere. Well, the coin's gonna reach the bottom faster. Well, why is that? Air resistance, right? Air resistance is gonna affect our overall fall. We jump off the top of the stratosphere and one of us jumps off and has a bungee cord attached to us. 
and the other jumps off and has parachute, the person on the bungee cord is going to reach the bottom faster than the person with the parachute. Air resistance. But in a vacuum, if we weigh the same, you know, it doesn't matter. Actually, it doesn't even matter if we're weigh the same. So if I jump off in a vacuum, first I'm going to suffocate. That's beside the point. I jump off in a vacuum and a kid jumps off in a vacuum. We're going to reach the bottom at the same time because we're going to be traveling the same acceleration. It doesn't matter our mass at that point, right? But air resistance is going to slow us down apart. In, in a vacuum, there's no air resistance, so it's completely negligible, right? Air resistance will noticeably slow the object with large surface area, like falling feathers, piece of paper, but less on, on stuff like more compact objects like stones and baseballs. Let's say we changed baseball and made the ball a flat disc. So you're throwing a flat disc. It's not going to throw the same, first of all. Right? And when it gets hit, it may not travel as far because it's not got the same shape and therefore doesn't resist air as well. Think of the difference between say, softball and a baseball, right? Kickball, right? When you kick a ball, I mean, most of the time, most of the time, your legs have a great amount of force, but that kickball doesn't travel as far as a baseball travels when it's hit by a bat. Why is that? The shape of the ball is different. Air affects it differently, right? If you're falling out of an airplane because, you know, it's hole inside a Southwest plane or something, is that too soon? When you're falling out of that airplane, if you can spread yourself out as far as you can and increase your surface area, you can slow yourself down noticeably, but eventually you're still going to reach a pretty fast speed because you're going to fall for a long period of time. You may not, I don't know, you probably still die, but you, your impact speed is going to be a lot different, right? So when air resistance is negligible, right? We talk about objects in free fall. I'm not gonna change necessarily objects in free fall. If I asked you how long, how long does something fall, we're just gonna assume that I'm talking about in free fall. Now I can change the gravitational constant if I give it to you. I could give you the gravitational constant from Mars or Jupiter or the moon, right? What about in space? How fast do things fall? Well, that can be a little difficult because space doesn't have gravity, right? So technically things aren't gonna fall. But let's say you're traveling around the space station. The space station has a mass, therefore exerts a gravitational pull on you. Theoretically, there could be a G around that, right? So that's kind of the idea. When we talk about Earth though, the gravitational constant is always gonna remain the same. It's gonna remain at 10 meters per second squared. Right? So just remember, don't mix up how fast something's falling with how far, right? How fast is velocity? How far is distance? One of the most confusing concepts encountered in this book is acceleration or how quickly does speed or velocity change? What makes acceleration so complex? It's a rate of a rate, right? It's often confused with velocity, which is just a rate. But acceleration is a rate of a rate. If you've ever drag raced, and I don't know how many of you ever have, I have, they'll give you a couple of things on your tick slip after you come out of your race. They're going to give you your average speed. They're going to give you your trap speed, which is when you hit a certain part of the racetrack, right? They will also give you an acceleration based upon the 40 foot mark, the 30 foot mark, stuff like that, how fast you're accelerating. So you can actually look at where you made up the great, the greatest speed so that you can use that in telemetry to maybe tune your car out a little bit, right? But remember, acceleration is complex because it's a rate of a rate. It's time times time. Acceleration is not velocity, nor is even change in velocity, but changes in acceleration would be a change in velocity, right? So I've got a bunch of assessment questions here. I'm not going to go through all these assessment questions. These are for you to review at your leisure. They will lead into the quiz. So I've got this lecture. I'm going to probably post the quiz tomorrow in the next lecture as well. So it'll cover about the first three lectures. All right, so I'm going to stop screen sharing, but there's a bunch of these quiz questions I put at the end of here are really good and help you prepare for the quiz and then eventually your final. So stop screen sharing. So I hope you guys have fun at your mock practical. Um, I'm going for a blood test tomorrow, so hopefully I can be marked as negative, please. That'd be great. Um, but I'll find out tomorrow that blood test will be come back instantaneous before I understand. But other than that, I hope you guys have a great day with Dr. Johnson. I'll post the other lecture up after tomorrow morning-ish, and it'll be on Newton's second law, maybe even the third law. We'll see.
But other than that, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. This is Mr. McKeever, and I'm signing off. Have a great day.